What up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Gen Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Shows. We got a lot, a lot to go over, a lot of Marvel stuff and Star Wars stuff to go over. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad to be back. I was on vacation for a week, so I'm ready, and I've been ready, waiting for the show because it's been such a long time. And Brian, how you doing? Good, 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 good. Also was on a bit of vacation and actually couldn't wait for Black Widow. I actually made it back to the movie theaters. And little did I know that when I sat down to watch F9, I was actually going to be watching Avengers 3.5 <laughs> because that is what that franchise has become, complete with multiverse, bringing characters back from the dead. Meta comments where Tyrese literally says, how come there's never a scratch on me when I get shot at? I'm like... <laughs> When did Universal and Disney cross over? I, I must have missed this, but it was fun to just be back in the theater. Did you want to go see F9? What would you think? Yeah. It was exactly what I want it to be, which is in no way realistic. We're so far past the point of believability, but the movie understands that and leans into it in a way that's really enjoyable. And, you know, bringing Han back, Makes no sense, but who cares? Mm -hmm. It is a multiverse, <laughs> basically, so why not? Like, John Cena as Vin Diesel's brother makes no sense, but <laughs> why not? Like, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. and, and I, I will say that I, Justin Lin, I'm, I'm a big fan of as a director, and he does stage big set pieces really well, better than any of the other directors in that franchise. Like, the okay. vehicular destruction he's able to create is is up there so it was just fun it was you know it was actually not that many people in the theater i know it did 70 million that opening weekend um but it was i was in an imax theater and was i mean i think there were less than 15 people total so i kind of had the whole quadrant of the theater to myself wow. um so no it was just nice to be back uh in the theater so very much looking forward to the black widow this weekend Baby, it will be very interesting to see how many people are in the theaters when you're uh when you get to go yeah. Right. Right. Because I, I got tickets for this Saturday, uh, next Saturday, and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing Black Widow. Man, I, I think it's gonna do. It's being projected. We'll talk about it. This is one of the topics in our show, uh, but let's get into it. Kevin Feige speaks, and you know, when he speaks. We have to listen. Every moment that this guy talks for at least five minutes, somebody's asking him questions that he doesn't want to answer and that he may, you know, dance around, but give us, you know, some uh, information for us to talk about and speculate on. So at the premiere of Black Widows, Kevin Spy, he was, was asked a few questions. Um, Brian, you sent me that, the, the YouTube video. I watched it. Uh, what do you think about his responses, especially the one uh, <laughs> regarding Alfred Molina? <laughs> uh, Alfred Molina probably not getting a Christmas card <laughs> this year from Kevin Feige. And I would say, no, I don't think they go so far as to uh, to kill off Doc Ock quickly. But uh, I think Kevin had this look of, I don't know, pure disdain when he was asked about Alfred Molina's openly discussing being back in the franchise on a podcast and kind of saying he's like well some people talk and some people he's like me i don't like to talk <laughs> so he clearly not was not happy with the lid being taken off that at this point um and you can tell he was he was kind of downbeat about it but but playing along i thought the, the there was a number of interesting things i thought the biggest thing that caught my attention was when he was asked about the disney plus series on the red carpet of a film the first film in two years and he said well we think of it as all one big mcu you know i always think a comment like that's kind of loaded we know that's true from a storytelling standpoint we're seeing that in these shows but it has i don't know there's something about the way he said it that has my feelers up for that he might mean it in other ways that have yet to be revealed so one, I'll just float, and I don't know what you think about this, but I'm not totally sure how, like when they're shooting the TV series, typically the way you shoot and format for TV is different than the big screen. But it crossed my mind of if they have a series that really hits big, like Loki's kind of become eventized. Would they then transport that 
to the big screen, like go the other way. So we've seen characters come off the big screen and go to Disney Plus, right? That's effectively what these shows have been. What about going the other way? What about a show or a series that really hits it big where they then turn around and say, okay, we'll show you this series in some theaters and then the next season, like we'll actually put it up on big screen. And I don't know, it just got me thinking as to like whether they're thinking about more creative ways of presentation as part of the comeback kind of post pandemic. So you uh, uh, let me just get this straight. You're, you're, you're thinking that there's, there's a possibility of them, you know, because Loki has become so big from week to week that they may want to do a, a separate series or a big series on screen on a week well, to week. Yeah, let me, let, me, let me throw let me throw a wild idea. This is totally I have no sources for this. But let me throw a wild idea. So let's say you had a you have a six. These are six parts, right? Mm-hmm. So let's say this show was big enough that for season two, you could either watch it at home as a subscriber like you normally do, or on a couple of screens locally, you could actually go and watch it on an IMAX screen. Is there a show, like would some of these, could these shows get to a level where effectively you're watching the six parts on a big screen? I don't know, the formatting is my question as to whether that can work, but assuming it was shot in a way that was fungible, it's just the way he said it made me think there's angles here that we're not privy to as of yet. I think that method would be too risky right now. I think what they may lead, lean towards is have a Let's say, let's say Loki series is huge, right? We're gonna we're gonna get a season two, and I'm I'm quite certain that we would agree that the events of Loki will have its presence in future films and future situations. There could be a possibility where we would see a movie that sort of brings it to its climax based on this series, I think we will lead, we would go that route instead of um, releasing, because I, I, I just feel like it would be too much too soon, even okay. if they did it, let's say next year for just to play around. I think they, they'll play around with this idea of series, big event coming, like for example, Secret Wars. I don't think that the finale of that storyline is going to be told on TV. I think the events leading up to will probably have a season one, possibly even a season two, right? And then the, the, the finale of that will be in a, in a theater. I think they're probably going to go that route first. Because at some point, if Marvel keeps on doing what they're doing and giving us great content, great stories, who knows what they might do, right? But at, starting now, I think they may lean towards the, the series. Huge event coming up. Let's end it with possibly a movie. I think that's where we go next with that. Yeah. Oh, and the Alpha Molly, he, there, was, there was something that the, the interviewer asked him towards the end about something you want to tell us about, something about the future. And he said, you might want to go ask Alpha. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, he's not too happy. He's definitely not too happy. Another thing that he was uh, talking about was a Scarlett Johansson situation, and that yep. this is her last film. And um, but he would possibly, um, no, he he would want to work with her, con- you know, in the future if the chance uh, was given to him to 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 make that happen. What were your thoughts on uh, on on his response to that question regarding Scarlett Johansson? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely sounds like, well, she has a producing credit on this film. It, it seems based on Kevin's comments, like she she basically was the person who brought the director into the fold versus Marvel itself sourcing Kate Shortland. So it kind of leads me to believe like very logical extension would be whatever Florence Pugh's character becomes in the MCU after this movie, Scarlett Johansson is probably going to be a producer on that. Right, whether it's a series, whether it's her own film, whether it's you know whether it's a team up film of some kind, it just sounds like that's the most logical extension. But then, you know, it sounds like look, not every performer wants to be a director or a producer. Some do, some don't. And I think that 
it would stand to reason that he's got decade long relationships with, you know, the Downies, Chris Evans, Hemsworth, like to the extent that Hiddleston, who has a producing credit on Loki, obviously now, to the extent that some of those characters have good ideas and want to then transition into writer's room and, and kind of be behind the scenes. I don't, and that seems like a great way to use their talents without us getting bored of seeing the same face yeah. on camera over and over again. So yeah. I, that's clearly there's something already in the pipeline. I don't think he says that unless there's another project that they are close on already. Oh, yeah, and I would yeah. guess it's Florence Pugh related right now. That would be like this. Yeah, I mean, Robert Downey Jr. Jr. brought in Shane Black for Iron Man 3. You know, he's certainly had has had his uh, fingerprints on a lot of the on the projects uh, over at Marvel. And I, it just Marvel just sounds like a great place to work if you're if you're a star and, and you're well liked. Right. And you have and you create that doorway where, come on, if you if you go, if you're sitting with Kevin at a dinner or you're hanging out with him, you're going to talk to him about stuff, right? He'd be like, hey, that's a good idea. You know what I'm saying? The opportunity is there if you're a star and if you and if you become a star because of the role that you've been given. That's that's huge. Well, I think um, the other part of it too is it's what it says to me is that Scarlett Johansson was easy to work with. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think the thing that we, you would be very diplomatic about it, but if you, you well, they weren't so diplomatic with Ed Norton, but in general, if you had somebody like who proved more difficult, but was a star, I don't think he goes back to the well in this fashion. Mm -hmm, you just mm -hmm. kind of say, thank you. Here's your check. Really appreciate the decade. So when he says that, it probably also tells you like from a collaborative perspective, he likes having her in the room and that, and the other creators and the parliament like that as well. So as I said, not everyone's cut out for it, but you'll, yeah. You'll kind of see, like, based on who shows, like, who shows up as producer here and there, we'll let you know, like, um, you know, who who uh, who is sort of like cut out for that. You know, so. yeah. Were there any other interesting things that he mentioned in that that interview? Um, I mean, those were kind of the main. Well, he would he he no commented Star Wars entirely. That it remains a third rail for him every time that he gets asked about it. He clearly is very cautious about talking yes. about that in any form or fashion and then he you know he did also throw in there because the producer tried to end around ask about john krasinski and emily blunt being in fantastic four and he kind of talked out of both sides of his mouth but he's his overriding headline seemed to be we're not that close on yeah. casting that yeah. was the other thing that sort of stood so it sort of says like whatever you hear in the rumor mill right now is probably more talk than what I appreciate about Kevin Feige and his responses is that when he talks about these projects and these rumors or whatever the case may be, it's like, yo, I'm not ready to talk about it because it's not something that's going to happen now. It might ruin something in, in some of our projects in terms of spoilers. You know, he's very careful. He's very thoughtful because us as fans, there may be some that want it all right away. But at the same time, he... I'm quite certain that he enjoys those surprises and wants to hear it in the reactions and when people go to the theaters and and what people say on Twitter and stuff like that, you know. So he's very very careful, and I and even though he may not say much about stuff, which is sometimes often clues as well. Um, he's 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 very. Uh, I would, I'm pretty sure he knows what's going to be asked possibly. Oh, he definitely knows that. And I would yeah. say the other thing is, look, 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 we know from prior comments, like Emily Blunt doesn't, you know, she's kind of disparaged the genre and doesn't <laughs> really want to be a part of it. But so let's say Kevin Feige wants to change her mind. Let's say that that's his goal. You know what a good way to absolutely guarantee she won't be in the movie is? Talk about it on the runway before yeah. it's a done deal, right? Because yeah. then mm -hmm. she's going to be like, all right, fine, I'm out, right? Yeah. So... He, he doesn't do it. He doesn't do himself any favors by eating those, you know, rumor mill flames. The other thing he did say, which I think we know, but I think it's, it speaks to the quality of what Marvel does is he said, you know, some of the rumors that you see are wrong and some are right, but he's like, but all of them help inform something about what we do, which is code for we read and we listen. That's all you can ask of your creators. <sighs> is there's no ego, I'm gonna do it my way because I like it this way. It's, 
What are they saying? What do they want? Let's see if we can make it work. That is not too like fan service or just want to show something. It has to make sense in the story that we're telling. And that's why Marvel is, is where it's at right now. Speaking of Black Widow, he also talked about, you know, the, the, the interviewer asked him about, um, is there, funnily, she said, there could be a possibility that Black Widow may come back and he just stays shut and, he, and she said, there's your answer. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, Kevin Feige is the man, yo. Um, Black Widow is set to debut this week and it's projected that it will debut at 90 million, around 90 million in the theaters. Uh, coupled with um, the $30 price tag if you want to watch it at home, which is going to be a very, very interesting number to observe as well when that comes out. Brian, do you think we're going to get those numbers for Black Widow this weekend? So as I said, F9 did 70 with no on-demand option. That's the biggest number we've seen by far post-pandemic. Black Widow reviews are significantly better than F9's reviews. Um, so that will be a factor. I think there's, it's kind of a push. I mean, F9 has a lot of franchise credibility with fans, right? So that's a, then they haven't seen a Fast and Furious movie, I think in four years, and we haven't seen a Marvel movie in, in two. So call it a push there, but yeah, I don't see why not. I mean, with, with, with good reviews in hand, and this is, you know, Marvel back after, you know, two years away, I think you could see that. I mean, if, if F9 did 70, like, yeah, I think the idea of 85 to 90, and then the really X factor is like, yeah, how many people stay home because of the the, thir the 30 buck option? I think a lot, I right? Like, I have a suspicion there's gonna be a fair amount of people who do both, man. I, I just feel like there's, and it could be in either order. It could be people who go opening night and then are like, great, I can see it again at home <laughs> with the family, right? Or yeah. they see it at home and they're like, Man, I got to see that on IMAX, and then they go on Sunday. I, I kind of think this is going to work out for them pretty well. Oh, yeah. um, I think Disney probably would prefer, in a weird way, that you stay home because they probably make more money. Tells you, um, you know, on the thirty dollars. Um, but at the same time, they obviously want theaters back too. So I think I think this will be interesting when they get on their second quarter call. We should get some numbers around what what actually happened with the with this simultaneous release and. Yeah, I mean, I saw those projections and you, I will say usually these projections are more conservative than aggressive and it is a wide range. I think it's 75 to 90, but yeah, I mean, if you, if you're putting up 90 with some States having just really reopened with a simultaneous on-demand option, it's a big number. It's a big number. Yeah. I, before the whole pandemic thing, I said Blackwater would get to a billion dollars. Who knows if they reach that close um, to that number? It'll be interesting to see. Um, I don't think they can, but you never know because the built up demand, the pent up demand for, to, for watching Marvel films and going back to the theaters. And yes, I guess we're returning to a sort of normal uh, situation and coupled with, you know, again, if I wasn't able to get tickets to see Black Widow in the theaters, um, I would have stayed home and, and paid thirty dollars, no question about it. You know, so and there's going to be a lot of people like that who don't probably want to sit in bad seats, who just want to probably just go to the theaters to see, don't care where they sit, um, and there aren't any tickets available, and they want to see it that week weekend because they want to avoid spoilers, they want to, you know. Right. It, it, it's, it's just an easy call for them to just pay the 30 and watch it in their big screen or whatever screen they have it on at the moment. So it's going to be a win-win. Let us know in the comment section below what you think of this weekend's um, return of Marvel in the theaters with Black Widow. Uh, do you think it's going to make 90 million over, over, over 100? And let us also know what you guys think about what Kevin Feige said in his interview. I'll link in the description. I'll have a link in the description below. And keep an eye on that global box too, because you know China obviously hasn't had a Marvel movie either in two years, and True apparently that. this these trailers have been testing incredibly highly in China ahead of the release. So I'm very curious to see 
how much you get outside the U.S. where Disney Plus is not necessarily available to everyone in the same way that it is here in the States. Real quick, Brian, do you think, do you think no pandemic, a billion dollars? And what do you think with the pandemic, does it get close or can it get to a billion? I would agree with you on the, on the pre pandemic, just cause I mean, I mean, granted, not quite it's the same, but Captain Marvel getting what it got, I think for me was sort of like, all right, well, if you can, if you can throw that up on the screen and get a billion one, then a, a better made black widow movie should be able to get into that billion dollar range. I've kind of said like, after seeing, you know, when we got good reviews, seeing some of the theatrical stuff that was coming back, even like when Godzilla versus Khan came out, I kind of felt like 700, 800 was, you know, back in play um, with China fully reopened and, and, and now the U S seemingly, I, I, I stand by that. I think kind of 800 feels like we're not, all the way back yet yeah. like this is probably that's a big number still yeah but i think like two years ago if you say we're talking about 90 million opening weekend that's a really good weekend but i think a couple of years ago this would have safely been at more like a 120 mm -hmm. you know 125 with the reviews that it has mm -hmm. so you're not totally where you need to be so i'm going to guess kind of like 750 800 for this which is still 800 plus whoever buys it yeah so you probably are going to get the billion you're just not going to get it yeah, stated yeah. as a yeah. single number yeah yeah yeah. Uh, next up, again, listen, you got to praise the guy when, when he does great things. Kevin Feige has done some tremendous things. You wouldn't even, you couldn't even think of the things that he has done before he did it. You wouldn't even fathom of MCU universe and theaters and TV. You got to praise him for that. But you also gotta get on him for some mistakes especially when you're trying to uh rationalize a, a, a purely bad mistake and kevin Bryan says he was defending somewhat the call on giving us the mandarin that we got in iron man 3. what are your thoughts on 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 this stance that they have and do you believe that one shot was a correction of that uh, of that mistake? I think he's defending it because he wants to be defending the people associated with the production from Shane Black on down. I think if he throws them under the bus now, that's not a great professional move. I think if you I think if you sat next to him on an airplane <laughs> with no microphone. And a few drinks. <laughs> but, and, and, and here's why I don't think he would defend it off mic is because we're getting the Mandarin now for real. Mm -hmm. They felt like that character had been done properly the way it was done in Iron Man 3 or the, were done the old. So if, if people go back to, there's a Comic Con, I think it's 07. This came <clears> out in 0. Wait, no, sorry, no, no. When, when did Iron Man 3 come out? Like 11, 2011, somewhere around there. The Comic-Con before that, someone asked Shane Black this question. And he was pretty dismissive. Or actually, no. You know what it was? It was after the movie had come out. Someone asked him about the decision. And he basically said, what are you kidding? You could never do the Mandarin as it was written in the comics today. He basically was like, it's impossible. It's insensitive. You could, that was 10 years ago, right? Yeah. I, you can find it. If you guys go Google it, he, he gives a very impassioned response, which basically says like, I started from the standpoint of this character was impossible to portray as it was written. Mm -hmm. So I came up with this joke twist to kind of work around that. And obviously now they've found a more serious workaround to create a real character and a real villain, which I think is going to be incredibly compelling. We'll talk about that. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's why he's on the record defending the choice. Um, and he even kind of intimates that I think Kevin does in, in the most recent comments where he kind of says like, there's sort of a hint in one of the things he says, which speaks to, it was kind of hard to crack that code at that time. And so this, twist that we came up with seemed like the best, seemed like a good idea or a good alternative. But then, yeah, one shot absolutely was meant as a retcon to basically acknowledge the uproar and yeah. say, no, 
it's like a meta Mandarin. Then there's a real Mandarin. There's a real 10 rings and he's ticked off. Yeah. And now we get the closure or the continuation of that in, in yeah. Shang-Chi. So I think it's more PR than it is like personal belief. I don't know. What did you think when you saw that? Now, the way you put it, I, I, I understand why he may have taken this route. I think you're right. If, if you're talking to him off camera and you asked him about this, I guess they really didn't know how to portray the Mandarin. And this was a, not a good way, but a fun way to do it. And, you know, you can make fun of a lot of things, but when you take characters that are well-known, especially from comic book people that know who these characters are and you make, you do something like that with a character that we're, you know, cause we're used to seeing Marvel portray characters as they are pretty much straight out of the comics. And to do that and to do it to someone like the Mandarin was very disappointing. Um, and obviously, like you said, he's not going to go out, you know, and, and say that openly, but he knows. And that's why I guess, you know, thinking about it, that's what makes Kevin who he is in terms of a professional and not really causing any drama unnecessarily, you know, they did what they did and that's why they did the one shot. And now we're on the right path, I guess. I still think, I still don't agree with the creative choice because I, I feel like Iron Man as a franchise had reached the stage where you didn't need this sleight of hand marketing campaign, right? Yeah. Th this movie was going to make a lot of money, regardless mm -hmm. of whether we thought Killian was the, the lead villain or not. He, you know, the Mandarin was central to the marketing. Remember they played those kind of yeah. home videos with him blurred out. That was a, how they teased the movie. So I think that fed into fans' disappointment because they felt like they were built up and led down this path, not just in the movie itself, but leading up to the movie to get this iconic character. And it turned out to be a complete bait and switch. And like I said, I just I think I think that movie would have made $400 million domestic box with or without that twist. And yeah. that's why I don't approve, even to this day, of, of the decision they made to use it. Um, I don't think it added anything to the narrative of, of that story, which you know, quite frankly, is another, I would say this along with Ragnarok are the two where critics generally liked it. Audiences really liked it. I could kind of take it or leave it. Iron Man 3 is not a movie that I rewatch a whole heck of a lot. Yeah, I agree with you there. Uh, yeah, let us know in the comment section below what you guys think of uh, Kevin Feige's comments regarding defending the, the decision making on on making the, Mar the, the, the what's it called? What's his name? Damn it, the Mandarin. Uh, uh, a joke. Um, for the most part, people whom I talk to about this stuff on, you know, on a regular basis, just to get their thoughts and ideas and feelings about certain things, they don't agree with this uh, uh, choice of, of making fun at, at, at a very serious character as a man did. Uh, so let us know in the comment section below what you thought of this. And you may notice that I'm not reading any articles because we got a lot to go through. I'll put still in the description a uh, 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 link so that you guys can check them out and, and you'll know what we're responding to. <clears throat> we got a second trailer. Shang-Chi. In this trailer, everybody was going crazy at what they saw. You saw the abomination fighting... At first, everybody was speculating, is this Wong? And Kevin Feige confirmed that it is Wong. Um, see the dragon? Look, Bruce, look pretty dope. Ryan, it looked pretty dope. Um, and you see some other things in there as well. I'm going to say something, and I want to hear your thoughts on what I'm about to say, Brian. For me, Waiting for Shang Chi, and the, since ever since the announcement was something that I've been excited for for quite some time. The more and more I watch trailers, that excitement sub you know subsides just a little bit. Um, and with each trailer that comes out, I get a little bit a little bit more not disappointed, but 
not that same excitement that I had originally when it was announced. And the reason why I say this is because for me, Shang-Chi, Shang-Chi is the master of Kung Fu. And if I think we did a show where we talked about, about Shang-Chi, where for me, the star of the show for me in this movie should be the fighting and the martial arts. When you see Abomination and Wong fighting, there isn't a lot of martial arts in that regard. We've seen very little of some of the moves. They have been impressive, but we haven't seen crazy amounts of fighting. I think they, they're saving that. And I'm hopeful that what we see in this will be something that we can appreciate. Because if it isn't, then for me, it'll be a, a somewhat of a disappointment and possibly something that, you know, we thought it'll make a billion, over a billion dollars. Let's say that, right? I think I even messed with two just because of the whole China thing. Um, I don't know it'll be that big of a, I mean, it'll make money in the box office, but I don't think it'll get to a billion. What are your thoughts? I think Marvel is at least a little bit nervous about this movie. Um, so let me tell you why. So I think the trailer is showing too much. I thought that in the first teaser, I think that even more so after this trailer. And I believe that when trailers show you more, it's because they're not convinced they can get you to go with less. So look at the Eternals teaser by comparison. You don't know anything about that movie other than the general motif and the look of it. But it's got everybody buzzing. Yeah. Which means they're confident. Mm-hmm. Like, we don't have to show you our hand because we can just drop little nuggets here and we got your money. It, I remember when they teased Terminator 2, they showed nothing. Why? Because they yeah. knew they had your money. Jurassic Park, the original trailer is like the logo from the book. There's no footage, it's or like there's a roar. Steven Spielberg's directing Jurassic Park, I'm in. By comparison, if people want to go back down the path, go pull up trailers for Green Lantern, X-Men Origins Wolverine. And if you've seen the movie, check out how much of the key action pieces are in the trailer. It's like 95%. There's nothing held back. And those movies were not good, which means they had to put the best foot forward in the trailer just to get your money. I hope that, look, listen, if there's other levels of this movie, and there might be, because we haven't seen much of the fight with the Mandarin, we haven't seen, to your point, much of the tournament, there's room for upside here. But I am surprised that we have seen as much of the fight on the trolley, as much of even him fighting in his costume, as and the fight on the skyscraper, which I think is the coolest thing that I've seen so far. I'm surprised we're seeing it because it almost makes me think like they're worried that the rest of the film, the non-action part is not enough to really get you interested. And I will say, I completely disagree. Now I, I am a, I am a complete fan of Tony Leung. So he, that guy can do anything he wants and I'll go see it. But when he walks up to him and says, God, I was right. That guy looks powerful sinister and i'm like i'll watch two hours of that guy i don't know i, I just i'm not I'm, to your point like I, I it's interesting to hear you say that because i have not been a fan of how they've marketed this so far and it has me a little concerned one one more mobile line of shang chi and when he and he says to him uh, be careful how you talk to me yeah boy. yeah it, it's his performance there is going to be very uh, you're going to feel his presence I, i'm going to say um, yeah, you, you're right. They've shown a lot. Uh, I, I still do, don't think that they sh- they've shown a whole bunch. I, I'm, I'm hoping that we get some surprises, some teasers of Iron Fist. Who knows? It, that, to me right there, a lot of the stuff that, you know, we're seeing Wong and Abomination there for, for some reason. I don't know why, but we're going to see them. Hopefully they have some explanation. It's just not them just fighting because they're there, right? 
that would be whack to me. Um, well, you said you didn't, and I agree with you. You said you didn't like the fact that that was in the trip. Yeah. I mean, cause it one the martial arts isn't being put in, 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 in the front row, you know, it's not, the spotlight is not on the martial arts because there's no martial arts between Abomination and Wong if they're fighting. This is more like a game to me, like a video game. Oh, let's put these two guys together. You know, what kind of tournament will this be? Maybe this is just one tournament in another place. This is not the main tournament. If this is a tournament, actually, we still don't know, I guess, what this will be but if there is a tournament and we're gonna see fighters i want to be able to believe these fights right um one interesting thing if one sends him back and puts him in the in that ice um, um landscape that they put um the other dude in in avengers in affinity war remember he saved uh he saved iron man in this in the park and he sent oh. him to some Iceland. Imagine he puts abomination there. And, they, you know, that would be funny to see if they did that. But let's see, man. Let's see. This is coming out when again? September. So I did see some comments from, from uh, Destin Daniel Cretton, who's the director of this film, talking about the inspiration for the martial arts. Okay. And he cited Jackie Chan and kind of the crouching tiger hidden dragon that balletic style which you have seen in the trailers and which does look good if you actually ask me what's the best fight scene it, it for me it's where he's fighting death dealer on, on the skyscraper at night because it looks a little bit like one of the bond movies mm -hmm. but then it's also there's a flash i think it's of the mandarin fighting michelle yo mm -hmm. in the field and that's very like classic sort of um asian epic you know martial arts wire work and that does look actually pretty beautiful but the jackie chan comments interesting to me because when i think of jackie chan martial arts it's more frenetic real world even a little comic yeah um jack which jackie himself i think has said in interviews like he, he was never going to be bruce lee so he always had to add that element but he was the master of sort of you know, using the environment around you to create this choreography. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know, for you, I think the way you, I don't know that that's what you necessarily want from this movie, that style, but it is seemingly what they, that, that shot on the trolley, there's hints of it, of him like, you know, where he's pulling the girl out yeah. back from the bus before yeah. she falls out and so forth. So I don't know, that's what he said for what it's worth. That's yeah. his inspirations. Listen, man. I think limiting yourself because, oh, this was done fantastic. We can't replicate it. We don't want a replication of what Bruce Lee did. I want that same feeling of, wow, this, dude's, this dude is unbeatable. He looks dope do, doing it. His, 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 his presence in terms of how he looked at his opponents, how he, you know, how he fought against them. He may have taken a few hits, but then we adjusted. It's just that, that, that that feeling of honest when you saw a fighter when you saw jackie chan fight you're like okay i'm gonna see i'm gonna be entertained i'm gonna laugh a little bit but you never got that sense of old oh, snap it's about to go down when bruce lee fought you wanted to see everything he did and how he did it how quick he was his um his swagger you wanted to see that being that shang chi is was born of the you know from Bruce Lee, right? He was that was that was the inspiration for that character. To give us a little bit of that, right? Of that presence, of that swag, of that fighting prowess, and in that style. The, a lot of Bruce Lee's fights, and I don't mean to get off on the tangent because we, we still have a lot to cover, but a lot of Bruce Lee's fights, there wasn't a lot of music behind it. There was just him and the fight and the dude fighting. You heard the punches. It was probably towards the end, you probably heard something, but it was quiet. It was just all about the martial arts. No distractions of music and stuff. That's what I was kind of wanting to see. Hopefully, they give us that. Who knows? Yeah, I, so I don't think you're going to get that. And I actually think that the trailers have used... Um, there's a very famous K-pop artist who's singing, who's rapping and singing in both trailers, Jackson Wong. Um, and that's actually got a lot of people overseas, I think in particular hyped up. So mm -hmm. I think the rumor is he's doing the soundtrack 
for okay. this movie or he is one of the co-writers of it and if he is then he's going to be featured in yeah, some yeah. of the key moments so uh i don't think you're necessarily going to get that the only you know the thing that like as i thought about the story and the, the character need does need to have a progression so mm -hmm. if this and this is an origin film in a way that black widow is not and in a way that the eternals is not either quite honestly that's that's not it's our introduction to them but it's not going to be an origin right yeah okay so you do have to leave room for the idea that his martial arts skill and his knowledge of the chi will grow over the course of not just this movie, but whatever his involvement in the MCU is. And that is a, has a visual component. I mean, presumably at one point he possesses the 10 rings and that unlocks something that he's able to do that he can't do just with his hands and feet. Um, but, you know, we know the end game from the comics is he needs to be able to fight a god like entity hand to hand mm -hmm. and not be embarrassed that's kind mm -hmm. of the his level mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so I, I leave open the option that maybe we don't see him fully realized as a martial artist in this film by design maybe at the very end okay. when he's fighting the mandarin you kind of get a glimpse of it and then you know later on you see something else I, which would be a little bit of a disappointment but it would be a choice yeah. and i guess a defensible one so. Yeah, I mean, speaking of, if he unlocks that power, it might be a power of, of duplicating himself. That's one of the powers that he has in the yes in the yeah. comics. So if he unlocks that, it might be something like that. Let us know in the comment section below what you thought of this conversation regarding not necessarily the disappointment that we have of the trailers. Well, it's somewhat disappointing. Um, but what do you think of what we've said in terms of them showing too much? Are you excited for this film as much as uh, I guess we were? Um, let us know in the comment section below. Next up, and we talked about Secret Invasion, um, but Amelia Clark hopes her Secret Invasion character sticks around in the MCU. Brian, you <laughs> sent this to me and you've said Amelia is trying to land something so that she can keep on working. Because the last, you know, she did her stint on uh, Game of Thrones, which blew her up. Then she got on um, the Star Wars train and it left without her. And now she's in the MCU and she hopes to stick around for the long term. And I read the article and, and it basically, to me, it says this. Listen, yes, she wants a job because, you know, if you work with Marvel, you have at least something for the next five to 10 years, possibly. And at the same time, you're a mega star. And number three, you're having mad fun. Traveling, talking to your peers, the other co-stars, because it's just never just one. You have other stars uh, uh, sitting in the same places, having dinner and just an amazing time working at Marvel. And so she wants that, but you know, who doesn't? Who doesn't? What, what were your thoughts on, on, on this? Well, I respect her honesty and, and I, I like Amelia Clark and I, I, I don't, I don't want to come off. It's, I feel like sorry that I would talk about her right the way I sound the way I talk about the rock and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm actually a fan of both as performers but her comments which i think were honest always make me nervous because she made a comment to the effect of well of course you want to be in these shows because that's where all the cool kids are like, yeah but that's not a reason to sign to want to do this yeah, 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 like, yeah that's not why you should want it you want to do it because you have a take on a character that you can bring to life mm -hmm. if your primary motivation is how many sequels you can get and how much bank you can make I'm nervous as to what I'm going to get from you mm -hmm. as a performer. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you you left out a big one because, yeah, so she was Han Solo's original love interest. That's a pretty prime role in the sci-fi universe. Yeah, That movie bombed and basically ended the extended universe of Star Wars. Mm -hmm. She plays Sarah Connor. Okay? She played Sarah Connor in Terminator Dark Fate. Okay. And yeah, that didn't go... Uh, that, that, I didn't that even know. That was horrible. <laughs> That, that movie went horribly. Yeah. So that's franchise number two. So you screw this up. Yeah. The Marvel machine. And not only that, but you get the Marvel show that has one of the guaranteed money-making characters, right? Nick Fury, Sam Jackson. Everything that guy touches makes a point. 
you've got a huge cast, right? You got Mendelssohn, you got Olivia Coleman, you've got the built-in story, which of all the stories that they've been bringing to life, this one is top Big. two or three automatic coolest day one. Don't have to sell it to the fan base. Yeah. Don't mess us up. Yeah. That's a third strike. You mess yeah. this up, that's it's three over. strikes. That's all I'm going to say. It's over. You're going to have to go do indies and hope something is good <laughs> to get your way back in again. That's right. But let's see, man. Hopefully, I think she, I think she's a professional and wh whomever is directing her will get the performance that they need in order to make the fans happy. Yeah, listen, I mean, this is, a like I said, it is a great cast. And it's actually, a, we don't even know all the characters besides Mendelssohn and Sam Jackson, but it's a cast that makes sense. Like you said to me, could you see you know, Mendelssohn having chemistry with, with Amelia Clark on screen? Yes. Could you see Olivia Coleman having chemistry with Amelia Clark on screen? Yes. Sam Jackson has chemistry with anyone you put yeah. on screen. Yeah. So I, I don't, like I said, I, I'm not like overly concerned. I'm saying this more tongue in cheek, but I am just pointing out the, yeah, the yeah, track yeah. record here. <laughs> we're, we're hoping it gets turned around. So. Yeah. I, I, I think they will. I think they will. Uh, next up. Yeah, let us know in the comment section, what, you know, what you think about Amelia Clark and her enthusiasm for her character to stick around. Um, I don't think she'll mess it up, man, because Marvel, they've made stars out of people who had bad careers. Robert Donna Jr. Is, is, is the number one. And they, Chris Hemworth didn't have a bad career. He barely had a career, and then they brought him in, boom. Um, Chris Evans had a career, but it wasn't something out of this world, you know? We knew him as uh, Johnny Storm, Fantastic Four, but we weren't like, he wasn't like, oh, snap, no, that's Chris Evans. Right now, he's Captain America because of what, how he portrayed that character. So Marvel, again, I have all the trust in the world in what they do and how they portray characters, except for the Hulk, they destroyed him. Next up, Olsen, speaks on the dark tone and compares it to a film that I was a bit confused when I read about it, Brian. Like, to me, Indiana Jones is not a scary film. Or not even that dark, right? It's not, it's not super dark. It's a fun adventure. I put it in the same sort of uh, section as national treasure and goonies and things of that nature right not in the horror not in this dark tone that they were making the compar comparison for um with dr strange indiana jones they just don't in my opinion don't go together other than the you know, if you go back to Temple of Doom, probably, um, the, what's that, the, what was the name of that film? The Last Crusade, um, when they were looking at, looking for the Holy Grail, these, you know, ma magic type situations. But other than that, I, I think it's a horrible comparison and I don't know what we're getting because originally this was supposed to be Doctor Strange 2 was uh, uh, the first horror film. Um, they sort of dialed it back, but still labeling in that genre with Sam Raimi because he did an Evil Dead in some other films, right? Mm -hmm. So the, I, for me, just the comparison was weird. What, what were your thoughts when reading this article? Um, well, first off, I think uh, Amelia Clark was in Terminator Genesis. I can't remember if I said that, not Dark Fate. Um, I think she's talking about Temple of Doom. It's the only movie that makes sense. Yeah. That's the dark indie movie. It is pretty dark, actually, if you go back and like, like the part with the thuggy and the, and the kids and the mine, like this, and the you know guy having his heart pulled out on yeah, screen. Yeah. Like there's yeah. some darker stuff there, like supernatural. And also there's that supernatural element of the voodoo doll and the, and the curse. Mm -hmm. I assume that's what she's talking about. I don't know where to go with that. You yeah. know, it's almost 40 years removed from that movie. And I don't know what exactly is applicable to the MCU here. I think you hit on the key point was the initial stories was it was a horror film and Scott Derrickson has track record in horror, but then left due to creative differences. That was the official reason. So clearly mm -hmm. he wasn't cool with whatever Kevin and the parliament wanted from the 
horror aspect of this movie. Maybe he wanted more, maybe they wanted less. Yeah. But then you're right, they bring in another director who is an expert in sort of the horror genre, among others. I, I will say this though, my, my confidence in this movie has gone up from watching Loki because Waldron's the one, he's one of the writers. Mm-hmm. And, and just having seen how snappy and tight the writing on Loki has been start to finish, I'm like, great. If they're going to have him be the more the voice of Scarlet Witch and Doc Strange, I, I, I have now I'm just have think the sky's the limit because this mm. guy's writing has been next level, um, start to finish. So I'm not too too worried. They do seem intent on really pitching you that this movie is dark, which always makes me a little bit suspicious that like the reality is not going to be what yeah. we think of as dark necessarily, but um. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm on, I find myself not concerned. And actually, I think coming off WandaVision, the way it ended, and by the way, I don't know if you want to talk about the, the little edit. Ah, yes. Yeah, so we might as well just talk about it quickly. But, you know, the way the show ended, I think you have to be excited. I mean, we've got Scarlet Witch kind of starting to be fully realized and maybe re- in references to Doc Strange being contacted. You know, we've got the dark hole, like, it's all there, and we still have the looming prospect of a Mephisto or a Nightmare or a yeah. Thawne, like all these avenues. Man, I, I don't know. I'm pretty bullish on this movie. I'm not too concerned. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I was on my vacation, and I was always checking on stuff, and just you know, just to see what's happening. Because uh, to me, that's a, a little vacation to me anyway. When I'm looking and reading, and, and I'm and I'm reading about that stuff, and I saw the the clip that people were posting, it looks, to me, Brian, it looks A, like a mistake. (laughs) B, like somebody did this for free. Like there was like, there was, it just meaning like, it just didn't look like there was money spent on doing this idea or whatever they want, whatever they wanted to do. It just didn't look I don't know. What were your thoughts when you saw that? It it it, it could be something. Uh, it just it didn't it just didn't look good. What what were your thoughts? I'm in this phase now after the whole WandaVision experience in general, where I kind of feel like Marvel's in on the joke and likes to troll the fans just <laughs> a little bit because they know they can. This felt in that category to me. They're like, you know what? If we just tweak the trees and we throw a little something in here like everyone will go crazy which is exactly what happened and like just does it really matter does it really really matter in the grand scheme of things exactly because we know where this is heading i mean yeah, like exactly and i think this marvel just like if people are getting too hot on the trail or something let's do something over here to get people to just talk about that stuff instead of moving forward with whatever ideas or speculation stuff so that they're, they're, they're talking about now. You know what's going to happen, though. So and w- I know we're not talking about Loki in, in this particular show. Mm-hmm. They're going to do it one time, though, because they are smart enough to know that, like, everyone, they read into everything, right? They see a name. They see a shadow. They see a picture. Everyone's reading. Oh, that must mean we're getting Reed Richards. That must mean Kang is it. But you know, as Kevin said, one out of 100 times, they're going to do it. There's going to be yeah. one show one where they're actually going to ha- And that's going to be the end of it. Because yeah. at that point, everyone will be validated. So that the next 100 times they troll you, you will buy it every yeah. time. That's all yeah. you have to do. So yeah. yeah. It'll happen. Probably when we least expect it. But yeah. Yeah, let us know in the comment section below what you guys thought of this. I mean, it just got people talking all about it every single day about what was this and, and the speculation is is just crazy off of this one thing. And I think honestly to me, it's, it means nothing. It means nothing. Cause it, it if it's Doctor Strange, okay, it's what we would have expected in the first place. Right. Right. So they're just, and who knows? And this is what people are saying that because of what's happening, in the Loki series, something changed. Right. That's, 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 that's what people are talking about because of what happened in Loki, something must have changed to make that change or that tweak. 
in WandaVision. Who knows? It'll be, it, it would be even doper if they did it to almost all the films. That would have been dope. All, all the shows, <laughs> right? That would have been dope. But we'll see. Um, <clears throat> we're on. Uh, uh, let's move on to um, something different in the Disney Plus world again. Uh, uh, Star Wars. Um, the Acolyte looks to start filming in 2022. Brian, I read the article regarding this, and it seems, yes, they're looking to do something much different, but from the perspective of, I guess, the dark side and not the Jedi, the Force, and all that other stuff. And this is going to be a little bit more darker. I forgot what they compared this to. Do, do you remember? I don't, but I will say every time I read about this show, it actually makes me think it's like House of Cards, Star Wars. Got it. And we, I guess we can't really speak Kevin Spacey's name that much anymore, but <laughs> the show was from the perspective of effectively the villain of the show. Yes, and yes. always was. Yes. And, that every, and it's a, it, it is a political thriller. That's, that's the motif of this show. I'm not expecting a lot of lightsaber duels and a lot of, you know, space battles and that sort of stuff. I'm expecting character driven drama on exotic star Wars planets in yeah. rooms with yeah. characters. I mean, that could be interesting, but that, that's my analogy in my head is what I'm thinking they're going for here. And it is, this is being set um, some 300 years before the events of the prequel trilogies, correct? Right. So we're going to definitely see some new stuff. Um, my only concern with stuff like this is like, okay, what does this lead towards for future stuff, right? I mean, 300 years is a lot to cover. Right. Um, so I don't know what it means for after this film. Let's say it, it does. It is amazing. How long can they go with this? Because Flash was amazing the first season. And so now we've had enough of it because it, it's not going anywhere. Right. So what are your thoughts on this? I think it has something to do with the fact that I don't think the future of Star Wars as a franchise is as certain as what the MCU has become. I I, I don't have a problem with it because I look at what they greenlit at you know, kind of last fall. And I think a lot of it is branching off the Mandalorian success, obviously. Mm -hmm. I think some of it is trying to feel out like what can Star Wars be going forward? Is Is it better off on Disney Plus? Is it meant to be a movie franchise again? We'll see. We're going to talk about, you know, the one movie that we do know is coming. But I think the short answer is they don't totally know. You know, the way that Marvel kind of knows. They kind of know where the goalposts are, where they want to get to. They know what's possible now because of the phase they've gone through. I don't think Star Wars has the benefit of that. This is not 1983. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not 2005 even. So I think a show like this is... I applaud them green lighting it because it's at least different. And if it doesn't work, it's one season and gone and it's fine. We watched it. If it hits and creates a character like the Mandalorian that we latch onto, then they have something. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think they, like when they greenlit the Mandalorian, do they know that baby Yoda, that Reef Karga, that, you know, the return of both. I don't think they knew all of that was possible or going to have the reaction that it did. They, they, you think? I think they, I think they knew it was going to be good. Mm -hmm. I don't think they knew it was going to literally reinvent Star Wars from the ground up, which is okay. what's happened. Yeah, okay. um, and what's interesting now is this show is filming early 22. We know Book of Boba or the Book of Fett. I'll go with your title. Yeah. That's the better one. <laughs> yeah. So, Multiple shows likely coming before you see Mando season three. Because Mando season three hasn't started filming, confirmed by Pedro Pascal. Does not seem like it's going to get in front of the camera ahead of this. Yeah. Um, so interesting. We're we're gonna it seems like we're gonna be taking a healthy break from the Mandalorian to let some other Star Wars kind of come into the world and, and see how that plays with audiences. Yes, I agree with you. Um 
this is going to be very interesting to see where Star Wars, if, if Star Wars can continue, it's because uh, I, I feel like Boba Fett, the book of Fett is going to be um, successful as Mandalorian has been, especially when you have, you know, Filoni, John Favreau, guys who are genuinely excited and are really having a thoughtful approach as to where they want um, Star Wars to go, the stories that they want to tell, the the characters that they want to introduce, I think they're they're, they're fans. And if you're a fan similar to how, how Kevin is a fan of the MCU, then the content that you're going to give is in tune, I think, with the fans and what they want to see. So I think uh, um, they're going to do well with this this show. Um, Moving on, well let, well, let us know what you guys think of the Acolyte and where the Star Wars uh, franchise is heading towards. Um, where do you think, do you think it's going to be successful? Let us know in the comment section below. Um, next up, Jenkins speaks on the status of Rogue Squadron, which would be the next Star Wars film that really doesn't have anything to do with um, possibly the you know the whole force the Jedi situation and here's the thing Brian I read this from first of all what I got from Patty Jenkins is like the way they're working now is so unfamiliar to her which speaks a lot to how Warner Brothers work Nobody really talking to each other. There's probably just one person saying, I want this, I want that. Really no collaboration as to what they wanted this to be, how the story wanted, how how connective, um, how, how connected they wanted this film to be with other films. She's in the process of doing that and she's learning um, how they work over there, and which, which is good for what, for whatever story that she wants to tell. My concern is for Rogue Squadron. It's similar to how I feel about Batman shows or movies that they do without Batman or his presence being felt, right? Or the acknowledgement of this, this, uh, I guess, the core of this world, right? It worked with with um, Rogue One. That was a massive success. But yet the elements were still there. The force was still there. That feeling was still there. Um, Darth Vader was in the movie. Ex exactly. Exactly. <laughs> because and because it told a story before what we had already seen. We knew where this is coming from. We don't know where this rogue squadron thing is coming from. If it's a movie, a standalone movie, I don't know, Brian. Am I interested? No, not really. Hmm. Interesting. Um, let's see. I mean, they went off the grid and, and tried to do something with Han Solo. Where I think we were happy with who Han Solo was. We don't really need... We didn't really need a, a retelling of his story, where he came from and how he got the ship. Who cares? We all know what happened there. Does this movie fall along those lines of a movie that really we don't know? To, we're going to be introduced to possibly new, new characters, right? Are we going to care enough about him in this world where this really is not really talked about and focused on or is we don't feel his presence? What are your thoughts? I disagree. I actually am very excited for this movie. Um, it, it, in a way that I think that Solo was doomed from the start because of the legend of Han Solo. And part of the legend of a great character is you have to have elements of the story that you hear about in the dialogue of other movies and films, but never see. Mm -hmm. And in a weird way, when you see it, it's always anticlimactic. Mm -hmm. So when they talked about the Kessel run and how fast he made it, there's no way you could put that on screen and have it live up to the hype that was created when they talk about it in the film. Like it's like this groundbreaking event. Mm -hmm. 
a movie like Rogue Squadron doesn't have that baggage. Yeah. To me, what I'm hoping for is honestly something like the aerial version of the aerial portions of Dunkirk, but just in X Wings and TIE Fighters. Like, if you watch Dunkirk, there's no context for Tom Hardy as an ace, he's Mm -hmm. just part of the battle. Mm -hmm. But the aerial footage is incredible on IMAX when you're just like, in the cockpit and he's dog fighting and stuff. And like, you know nothing about him. Yeah. And quite honestly, you don't need to. And so I'm actually hoping it's like that. I'm hoping it's like, a and because she's referenced that her father was a fighter pilot. I'm hoping that it is sort of this very simple, drop us in to a military mo- movie campaign. They have a mission. It's super cool. Like you're going to go up against, you know, the TIE fighters, the TIE interceptors. You're going to go up against the Star Destroyers. And you kind of see just how far kind of aerial and kind of flying effects have come. But you're just doing it in the Star Wars universe. I think if they just did that, I'm fine with it. I think even if they went and tried to do, like, I'm, like I would not recommend they do Top Gun Star Wars. Like, I don't think that's what this is. I would actually say that's a mistake. Like if you start mm-hmm. soap operating this it's not going to work but yeah. i also think there's a legion of people who have played the games now i know this is not based on rogue squadron the game x-wing x-wing versus tie fighter but there's a lot of people who have played those games through the years a movie version of that effectively that it brings in some of those elements i think there'll be an audience for it i think this can work i'm a little surprised I know why she wants it on the big screen because of the flying effects. I'm a little surprised they gave her that. This almost felt like it could have been like an eight episode series Mm -hmm. about the pilots, but you know, we'll see. We'll see how it plays. (laughs) I'm actually excited to see it. And if I think they're done with a script or pretty close, it seems like Mm -hmm. would indicate we should be, we should be getting some casting. I would think in the next couple of months, she should be ready to kind of, kind of have that out there. Yeah, my concern is, are people going to care about it? Is it going to feel familiar to them? Um, it's the only Star Wars movie they're going to have in the next three years, though. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. Again, I, and I, I didn't know, even even you mentioning that, they, uh, that this was, uh, even though it's not based on it, you know, this was a game. People, you're gonna have an audience, but you know, Mortal Kombat had an audience too. You know, oh, I hope it's better than that. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I it's just we'll see, we'll see. I, I just don't have the high hopes that some others may have for this film for it to be successful. I I just don't know if people are gonna latch onto this film, even though it's in the Star Wars world. You know. Um, but well, let's see. Uh, let us know in this comment section below what you guys think of Rogue Squadron and will it live up to whatever hype it, it develops and will it, you know, make Star Wars money? You know, because Star Wars, even bad films make a billion dollars. <laughs> so we'll see. Let us know in the comment section below. Aquaman 2, Knives Out 2, um, John Wick 4 have all begun filming. Aquaman 2. We agreed, Brian, that Aquaman 2, I mean, Aquaman, the first Aquaman film wasn't, uh, it made money, but it wasn't like, oh my God, this was, Aquaman was all right, man. It was okay. I haven't watched it again. I don't think it was that great of a film. It made his money. People, there's some people who, who, who really enjoyed it. I enjoyed some aspects of the film, but in terms of storytelling, in, in terms of Aquaman himself, yeah, Aquaman, um, Jason Momoa looked, you know, like a good Aquaman, you know, but he didn't remind me of Aquaman. Um, Visually, the movie was cool, but in terms of storytelling and some of the characters, just for me, it just felt flat. Yeah, I, it wasn't that great, but it made a billion dollars. So they're going for Aquaman too. And this is going to be, the title of this of, of Aquaman 2 is The Lost City. Lost Kingdom. Oh, Lost Kingdom. 
Why have I, why have I heard that title before? Have you heard that title before? The Lost Kingdom? Maybe a book. Who knows? But well, there's Lost World that's been done yeah. many times. And yeah, so. it just doesn't call me that title. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what story they're going to tell. Um, I'm pretty sure there's some sort of a theory of, of what this movie will be. But um, we've and we've spoken about it in the past before what this movie might be because of Jason Momoa and, and what he stands for and wants, what possibly he wants to do. And he wrote some of it. He wrote, he wrote a first draft. So I'm just going to be like, hey, listen, man, I'm not really looking forward to this film. <laughs> well, uh, but I, mean, I, I you tell me. You did. Yeah. I liked it better than you did. Well, well, let's look at kind of what we have on the board. So first off, we got official confirmation that Amber Heard is coming back. We got an official social media shout out from James Wan welcoming her back. I think she just had a baby too, like literally yes. right before filming started. So so all that question about whether the petition would cost, no, no she's in the movie. I think the other interest, most interesting change to me from Aquaman 1 to 2, just in terms of what's gone on around them, is um, Yahya Abdul-Mateen has blown up as an actor, right? When they cast him as Black, they caught him on the front side of what became his rise to now stardom, where mm -hmm. now you know, you're going to see him in The Matrix later this year. and He's been frontlining. He was in Trial of Chicago 7. Like, he's been in critical acclaim. He's been in, you know, blockbuster stuff. Yeah. I'm assuming they're going to ride that. I'm assuming that he has a big part. The way that the, the, the stinger scene at the end of Aquaman 1 kind of indicates he was kind of going to be featured uh, in the next one. I think they'd be dumb not to. I mean, he's probably the most marketable piece besides Momoa to this movie. Yeah. So that, but then that leaves the question, is that enough? We know Patrick Wilson is back as the ocean master and it's like unclear. Is he turning good in this? Is he still want vengeance? I, that sort of TBD. Um, and then I think it's, what else can you do with the look and the underwater? It felt like they threw a lot out there in the first one, right? The, the color palette, he visits a lot of places, right? Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, like, the, the trench is not happening as a movie, but I'm oh, assuming the God. trench will come back in this film since James Wan said there'd be more horror elements mm -hmm, to it. Mm -hmm. But they covered a lot of ground. So I'm kind of curious to see, like, what is new? Like, where else can we go in this world that feels different and feels like something we haven't explored yet? Because I think that's critical. Uh, like, when I think about Avatar to you know, Cameron's made it clear, look, we introduced you to Pandora, but we're going full speed underwater for the second one. We, that's, that's the new element. We're going to spend time there. It's a smart choice by a filmmaker to just say like, look, you're in the same universe, but I'm going to show you some, yeah. some different planets. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious how that works in this film. But look, I mean, as you said, with the money that it made, the audience is clearly there, whether we like it or oh, yeah. not. So yeah. They got everyone back, so the expectations are going to be high, and DC needs this. Needs it. Yeah. That's the other part. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean... Because Wonder I, Woman 84, whatever else you thought of it, the pandemic definitely derailed the finances to some degree. Yeah. So there's a couple hundred million bucks that they didn't get out of that film that they probably had as a lock. Yeah. To need this movie. I mean, we also didn't talk about this real quick, but um, Patty Jenkins is still seemingly on board to still doing um, Wonder Woman 3. So, and she's also doing another film with um, a gal uh, called Cleopatra. So let's see if Wonder Woman 3 gets actually done. I, I, with, who I think knows? it gets done. I still think there's a chance that Patty doesn't direct it. I still think there's a chance okay. she winds up being producer, writer, and they hands off to someone else because of how busy she is. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, that's our show for today. We covered a lot. Again, when we have these discussions, we're really trying to understand what's going on in this world. The people making these decisions, the people involved in these projects and the things that they say we sort of you know analyze and speculate on what's going to happen why it's happening how it's happening should it happen 
do we want it to happen? Stuff like that. And, and we really do appreciate you guys for joining us once again. Brian, any last words? Oh, it's just hard to believe that Black Widow is coming out this week. Yeah, that, It's like we're here finally. That's awesome. So I think next time we talk, we'll be able to talk about what we thought of the film. Yes. And again, there's mixed. Um, I, I don't know if you saw um, the guy that was the, the antagonist in Blade. Um, he Even played Dorf? Dick. Yes. He said that Black Widow looks like garbage and that he feels sorry for Scarlett Johansson being in this film. He, he says it looks like a video game. He went all in on this film in a negative way. I, I, whatever, right? But then you get the you know, majority of people that said that it was a great film. Um, some saying that not on par with like Winter Soldier and Infinity War Endgame, but still a, 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 a great film nonetheless. And the Rotten Tomato score tells us, you know, a lot, you know, a lot, a lot of films that are bad get 80%, you know? Um, so is it right now is about 84, 85? 84, 85, that, which kind of tells you it's, you know, the Winter Soldier, Civil War, Endgame, they were up 90 to 97, you yeah. know, 85 is kind of that next tier down. I mean, that's yeah. more than good enough for yeah. after two years, but yeah, yeah, it would sort of tell you it slots in behind the, the best of the best that Marvel's put out there. Listen, when Marvel puts up a movie that's 75 and, and, and above, I'm happy. If it's 30 or 40, like what was what was Thor The Dark World? Probably like 30 or 40%. No, it wasn't. I don't think, man, I, uh, we'll have this stat next time. I, I think it's higher than you think. I think Thor The Dark World was actually still fresh. I think it was like- Yeah? 60. Yeah. I gotta look this up real quick. Actually, yeah, it was 66%. Told you. I don't think Marvel's actually ever had a rotten movie. Don't quote me wow. on that, but I don't believe they've ever had a movie that officially was considered rotten on Rotten Tomatoes. We'll, we'll have that stat for you next time. Yeah. But yeah, that's our show for today. Thank you again, once again, for joining us. Please hit that like and subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. Please comment in the comment section below. Let us know what you guys think of the conversations that we have. Tell me, you know, your opinion of what we, we, we spoke about and your opinions on the articles that we leave down in the description below. And uh, we'll see you next time on the Nerd Gen Report. Thank you for joining us once again. Bye.